Hello and welcome to this St. Matthew's online worship service. My name's Joe, I'm the curate here, and I will be uh, guiding us through this act of worship. And Reverend Jim, our rector, will be preaching for us later on our Acts passage. If you're new here, then welcome. If you've been a hundred times before, then welcome to you as well. Uh, why don't you say, say hi, perhaps introduce yourself, Tell us how your week's been over in the live chat off to the side. We've got no real notices to share with you uh, this week, except to say that later in this service, you will see a uh, testimony video. And if you would like to be involved in testimony videos and would like to share your testimony uh, at some point in the near future, then please do get in touch with me at curate at stmatthewswalsall.co.uk. We've all got a story of how God has been working in our lives and it's just, it's great to share them and encourage one another and build each other up. So why don't we do that? Without further ado, uh, we'll have some opening words and an opening prayer. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people we've gathered, let us worship him together. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. 
Breakfast on the beach. One night, some of the disciples went fishing. Then they saw Jesus waiting on the beach. He had lit a fire. So Jesus had breakfast with the disciples beside the lake. Jesus was alive. Take a look at the activities that can be found on our activity sheets on the website. Show us what activity you've been doing this week by posting on social media for us to see. Join in with this interactive prayer by filling in the gaps. Dear God, I'm so thankful you gave me I'm so glad you helped me with I love you because Please help me tomorrow as I Please look after Amen
We come now to our confession. It's the time where we uh, quiet ourselves, we take some time to reflect on the ways that perhaps our lives don't uh, match up with that message of Jesus, that message of, of love and peace. And we bring those things before God and we say, God, we, we want to be better. God, help us to be better. So if you feel able, please join in with the words that will appear on the screen. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. Christ came in humility to share our lives. Forgive our pride. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ came with good news for all people. Forgive our silence. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. Christ came in love to a world of suffering. Forgive our self-centeredness. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May almighty God, who sent his son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as the spring season continues to explode around us in orgies of colour and new growth, we thank you for the beauty of the natural world. As the renewal of all growing things gathers pace, let us reflect on the fragility as well as the immensity of the world around us, and make fresh efforts to care for it. Keep us mindful of how easy it is to endanger the natural world with our seemingly never-ending quest for more and more things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the people of India suffering the loss of many thousands of their relatives and friends to the ravages of COVID-19, having seen the struggle for breath in the face of crippling shortages of oxygen and ventilators. O oh Lord, as other countries offer equipment and surplus vaccines to help India in its crisis, we pray that you will move the hearts and minds of even more countries to offer what help they can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we in the UK enjoy increasing freedom from the strictest limitations on our movements and social interactions, let us remain mindful of the need for caution and moderation in our demands. Holidays don't have to involve flights to somewhere hot and sandy. For many people, exploring parts of their own country would be a revelation, as well as a much needed boost to those businesses whose survival depends on visitors. We are doing well in our fight against COVID-19 with the combination of vaccine and caution. But it would be so easy to backslide into yet another round of sickness, death and isolation. Let us ask God to strengthen our resolve, bolster our spirits and keep us mindful of our responsibility to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your care all those whose lives are disordered, whether by physical, 
or mental ill health, by family or household circumstances, by conflict or violence, or by any other cause. Whether they are known to us or not, we ask for your blessing on them, so that they may know healing, comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Collect for today. Risen Christ, your wounds declare your love for the world and the wonder of your risen life. Give us compassion and courage to risk ourselves for those we serve. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. There must be more than this, O oh, breath of God, come breathe with it. There must be more than this, Spirit of God, we wait for you. Fill us anew. Spirit of God, to fall in this place. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with us. Come like a rushing wind, clothe us with power from on high. Set the captives free, leave us abandoned to your praise. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your glory fall, consuming fire, fan into flame. A Spirit of God, would you fall in this place? Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with us. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, a passion for your name. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, a passion for your name. Consuming fire, fan into flame. A passion for your name. Spirit of God, would you fall in this place? Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way with us.
If you'd like to give to the work of St. Matthew's Church, then you can head over to the website, stmatthewswalsall.co.uk forward slash give to make a, a donation or set up regular giving. If you're eligible for gift aid, then please do make sure to set that up. You'll also find some information about how you can get involved with the work of St. Matthew's by giving your time. You can get to all of this information by scanning the QR code on the screen as well. First reading comes from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, and I am reading from the NIV. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoke to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are pricked up then thrown into fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I recently had the opportunity to meet up with John Llewellyn to record a testimony video about how his faith has grown and developed uh, throughout his whole life. And we're about to watch that video now, but before we do, it's just to say that we hope that these testimony videos can help to bring us together as a community. Perhaps we can get to know each other uh, on a level that is slightly deeper than might just come up in conversations over coffee after church. And we want to share with one another the things that God has, is doing in our life and has been doing throughout our life. Just to build one another up, to encourage one another. So, I hope you enjoy this video. I hope you take something from it. Literally my whole life was overflowing. It was full. There was no time for enjoying anything outside of the, the learning and the working. This is John Llewellyn. And his is a story of lifelong, reliant and dependable faith. I left school at 15 and went into the coal mines and seven days a week was normal. I always found time to go to my church, for me and for my family, uh, afternoon, Sunday afternoon or evening. So even working seven days a week, I was still able to find time to go to my church because I needed that church service to recharge my batteries. My batteries would run down every week and coming into church and meeting the other people in the church was like recharging the batteries and giving me the impetus to carry on for another week. John's faith is deep and multi-dimensional and this is really brought out in those two simple disciplines of singing and silence. I think singing in the church is really uh, an embellishment of, of your faith because it's your enjoyment of, of what your faith is about. It's really adding another dimension to your faith. Faith is an inward thing, whereas singing 
is an outward thing. Uh, and really, when you're singing, you're sharing with everyone else the, the joy of what you're doing. Silence in worship, and in church in particular, is about coming closer to, to God, coming closer to your faith, another dimension of your faith. Um, we all tend to rattle off our prayers and beg and ask when we need help and then forget about our faith while we're busy, busy, busy. But in the quietness, you can let your faith take over and allow God's way to influence you. And it's only through the quietness, through the real quietness, through the giving him space to come into your life that, uh, that you really en can enjoy and understand that. I feel that my faith goes back a long, long way to my early 30s when I was fortunate enough to be sent by uh, the vicar at this church here at that time to a weekend course and we were asked about the resurrection. Straight question, did we believe in the resurrection? And we thought about this over the weekend and each of us were asked to commit ourselves to that and I Although I considered myself a Christian for years prior to that, that question really went down to the basis of everything in my faith. And because of that question and because of the response and because of the involvement at that church weekend, uh, the resurrection came to mean a lot more in my faith and a, an everyday part of my faith. John mentioned in passing that this year would be his 60th wedding anniversary and I just had to find out more of that story. On Saturday evening, my mother literally took me by the scruff of the neck and decided to take me with her to her dancing class, to her dancing meeting. Uh, that invitation by my mother or instruction literally being dragged out against my will uh, resulted in meeting my wife Jean. So we met at 18 after we'd known each other for five years we were fortunate enough to marry and are now coming up to our 60th anniversary. We were able to share literally everything and understand each other so our whole married life, that 60 years, has been based on our joint combined faith. And uh, I just consider that she and I have been extremely fortunate. Jean was only diagnosed with dementia two years ago, but I believe that her dementia started 12 years ago because of the changes that happened 12 years ago and that uh, I have been living with and caring for her for 12 years. She virtually switched off and we didn't know it was dementia until it was confirmed two years ago. But for me, it's been 12 years of caring and gradually seeing the deterioration which happens with dementia. So uh, it has gone on for a long time. 12 years is a long time for anyone. When you're doing it seven days a week, 24 hours, there's, there's no letter. I asked John how his lifelong faith had helped him through these more difficult times. I've always believed that you can pray anywhere. I've prayed when I've been driving up motorways because my work took me all over the UK. I've prayed when I've been in coal mines underground. I've prayed when I've been on holiday. 
And one of the features of my faith is that whenever I'm on holiday, uh, I always make a point. The first thing I do when I arrive is find out where the local church is, what time the services are, so that come Sunday morning, I can fulfill my communion commitments and enjoy a Sunday morning communion before I enjoy the rest of the holiday. So enjoying the communion, which has been probably the highlight of my church faith, has always been a part of my faith through my whole life. And I feel privileged that it, that faith, that understanding has never left me and it's never been in doubt. So even when bad things happen, you just sit back, take stock and realise that, you know, you're not in charge, he's in charge. And as long as he's in charge, we can cope. This reading comes from Acts chapter 8, starting to read at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. You may remember last time I preached, I talked about intentional conversations about Jesus. Well, today is a great example of that. Today, we are thinking about the idea of finding out what God is doing and joining in. But first, let me give you an example from my life. Some of you may know that I've been heavily involved in the Alpha course for the last 20 or so years. In that time, I've led about 25 courses. I've ran Alpha Weekends away and Alpha Days away. I've also been a local Alpha advisor, but it wasn't always like that. You see, I first came across Alpha about 30 years ago. I was one of the first people to be able to go on an Alpha course when it started to become a big national course. And I found it boring. It didn't suit me. I was completely turned off by it and actually I became very negative towards the Alpha course. Ten years on from that I got ordained and as a curate I arrived at my training church and within weeks of arriving the vicar, Peter, informed me that he wanted me to start coordinating Alpha. You can imagine how thrilled I felt. 
I was dragged to an Alpha conference where Nicky Gumbel and Sandy Miller, two of the founding fathers of Alpha, could explain what it was about and to find out more. And my feelings began to change. And as time went on, I began to get really excited about the prospect. And eventually I couldn't wait to start that first course. Part of the reason was because I could see that Alpha was being greatly used by God to tell people about Jesus. God was using Alpha for mission and I wanted to be part of that. So how do we go about finding out what God is joining, doing and joining in? Well, the reading we had from the book of Acts about Philip and the Ethiopian is a good example. Philip was in tune with God. We might call that prayer. So much so that an angel was sent to guide him. Philip was to go in his direction and ended up by being next to a main road. He was sent to the main road between Gaza and Jerusalem. And whilst there, he sees this carriage coming down the road and the Holy Spirit directs him to go alongside it. So Philip does that and he hears the man reading from scripture. Naturally, he asks the man if he understands what he's reading. The man says no and he asks Philip to explain. You could see that as the Holy Spirit actively working in the Ethiopian before he becomes a Christian. That the Holy Spirit is providing a way for Philip to join in. If we look, we can see that in people's lives today. Sometimes people don't know why, but they really want a wedding in church. Or somehow when a baby is born, people feel the need to acknowledge that in a, a spiritual way. Perhaps a thanksgiving or a baptism. Here at St Matthew's, whenever the church doors are open, people just drift in. And some of them just don't know why. They just feel drawn here. The Holy Spirit is often working in people's lives and he invites us to play our part. And of course, Philip takes the opportunity. You could say Philip actively looks for the opportunity. The Ethiopian invites him into the chariot to explain. And once Philip explains it, the Ethiopian asks if he can be baptised. Philip takes the opportunity and he acts. And then at the very end of the passage, Philip is taken away to carry on the good work of preaching the gospel. And it seems to me that perhaps is a really good way of structuring our mission. Pray, look, act. Perhaps that is how we find out what God is doing and join in. So let's start off by thinking about prayer. When we pray, we need to be open to the Holy Spirit. Too often people are so focused on telling God their needs and their wants in prayer that they forget to listen. It's really important that we allow time for God to speak to us through the Holy Spirit. If we have a regular quiet time or a time when we read the Bible each day, I'd like to encourage you to have just a few minutes of quiet at the end of the session and in that time invite God to speak to you. Ask God what he wants to reveal to you, either through the Bible reading you've just read or through your own thoughts and prayers. And if you do this, I promise God will put thoughts in your mind. You may need to test them, but the ideas will come. So when we pray, we need to be open to the Holy Spirit. But we also need to ask God to be involved. If we want to be involved in God's mission, we need to ask. As you pray, God might reveal things to you that you are to act on. Sometimes God might have a message for someone else that he shares with you. Sometimes God will make it very clear that he wants you to be involved. But we need to remember that it is God's mission and it's right and appropriate that we ask him to use us. 
to use us in whatever way seems right to him. And that links with most importantly that when we pray, we need to have the right attitude. It's very easy to sometimes go into things with the wrong attitude. I know, I've had that experience in my life and I'm sure I'm not the only one. It reminds me of the story told of two monks who were having a conversation in their monastery. Now they were both smokers and found it difficult to go out or go on for any length of time without nipping outside for a quick cigarette. The first one decided to go and speak to the abbot about it. He reported back to his companion 20 minutes later that the abbot had been furious when he had asked permission to have a cigarette when he was praying. And as a punishment, he was to be limited to a diet of stale bread and water for three weeks. Well, his companion decided he needed to go and see if he could do any better. A short while later, he returned to his friend with a beaming smile on his face. His friend asked him if he'd been given permission to smoke. Oh yes, he said. It's all in the way you ask. Instead of asking if I could smoke whilst I was praying, I simply asked the abbot if I could pray whilst I was smoking. And he was delighted with me. He's even given me three extra hours of my usual duties to spend extra time praying. You know, just how it, like it can be important to ask the right question. When we're looking to be involved with God's work, it is crucial to have the right attitude. Many of you will know the Bible story of Moses and the burning bush. The whole point of the story is that God is giving Moses a job to do. But Moses makes all these excuses. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? S suppose I go to the Israelites. What if they ask me what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. I am slow of speech and tongue. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Moses makes all these excuses. And each time Moses makes an excuse, it's like God is saying, look, Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. Having the right attitude is so important. And the right attitude is simple. We pray it every week. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Sometimes we have to push at doors to see if they open. If it's right, God will let us through the door. If it's not right, God will shut the door. But sometimes we don't know whether it's right until we push at the door. But we've always got to have that attitude. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So once we've prayed and God has given us a direction, we then need to get on with it. And we need to look. We need to be bifocal when we look. We need the, the big picture lenses to look at what is going on in people's lives and in the life of the community. We need to look and see if there is an obvious need that God is pointing you towards. Does the local food bank need more volunteers? Do elderly people who are lonely need somewhere to go and someone to talk to? Does the local school need people to be governors or to hear readers? Does the Alpha course need people to come and help? Is the church desperately needing people to volunteer? Not just in preaching, leading, reading and saying intercessions, but perhaps in helping broadcast the service online, setting up and taking down the cameras. So first, look with big picture lenses to see what is needed in the lives of people and the community. See where God is pointing you. But then we need to use our bifocal lenses that are to do with the details. We need to look at what is going on in people's hearts. Is there a sense of oppression in the area? 
Is there something unsaid in someone that God is pointing you to? Let me give you the example of Sally. Uh, and by the way, I do have permission to share this story. Sally came on an Alpha course a number of years ago that I was leading in a local pub. But there was a real spiritual battle going on in Sally's life. One week, Sally was scared, really scared by the things that were happening to her whilst she was exploring the Christian faith. She got home from work and she felt so weak and desperate that she opened a bottle of wine and started drinking it at breakneck speed. She says a voice in her head was telling her she couldn't allow herself to go on Alpha, so she didn't. The voice in her head told her over and over again that it was all a complete waste of time, that she was better off beforehand, that she wasn't good enough, that she was kidding herself about God and that even if there was a God, he wouldn't want her anyway. As she drank, she sank further and further. Sally eventually ended up in tears on the doorstep of the person who had been supposed to be taking her to Alpha. Later on, Sally wrote this for me. In what I now remember as a somewhat bizarre yet heartbreaking night, I found myself sitting in her car outside the pub while she ran in to get Jim. He came straight out and sat with me in the car, all the while talking to me and trying to calm me down. He told me he had a feeling I was involved with the occult and that I'd never experienced unconditional love. At that moment, I remember thinking, ha, she said she wouldn't tell. And I turned to ask my friend if she told him the stuff I talked to her about. She assured me that she hadn't and Jim told me it was just a feeling he had. And for some reason, I believed them. Jim prayed for me in the car and asked God to help me. And once my breathing had slowed, I remember feeling calmer and that somehow it was going to be OK. I remember this incident very well. I remember the sudden spiritual awareness that a spiritual battle was going on because Sally was involved in the occult. That's what led me to say that in the conversation. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit prompting me, allowing me to see into Sally's heart. Well, a few weeks later, Sally, her friend and I had a fire in the vicarage back garden where we got rid of all the occult writings and cards and paraphernalia. A little while later, Sally moved to another church and she has grown and grown as a Christian. Since then, she has been traveling the world a bit doing missions in Africa and Asia. In fact, she's been invited on multiple occasions to women's conferences in India to speak and to be involved in ministry and to share her testimony of God's amazing healing power at work in her life. We may need to ask God to help us to look into people's hearts. And then once we have prayed and looked at what God is doing, we need to act. You may have heard the old story about three frogs sitting on the log. Three frogs are sitting on a log. One decides to jump. How many are left? The answer is three. The frog made a decision but took no action. We need to be prepared to act. We are God's hands and feet here on earth. He wants us to be involved in his mission and acting generally happens in one of two ways. Firstly, with words. Sometimes we need to say something. It may be words of comfort. It may occasionally be words of truth that people don't want to hear. It may be sharing the good news of the gospel in words, telling people about Jesus how Jesus came to bring life and life in all its fullness, as we heard last week. It may be words on behalf of the oppressed and downtrodden, speaking for people who, for whatever reason, can't speak for themselves. It may be the words of encouragement that build people up 
and to make a difference to their lives. So we may be required to act by using words, but I believe just as likely it may be with actions. I don't know if you've ever noticed Epaphroditus when you read the Bible. He appears towards the end of Philippians chapter 2 and also in chapter 4. He's one of Paul's helpers and trusted co-workers. I once heard the comment made about this passage about how great it is to have people in our lives who just get on and help. People who see a need and act. People who will put themselves out for others. People who will make a difference to the community but often go unseen. People like those who come into church every week and clean the building. Or like the person who straightens the chairs after services ready for the next people to use the building. Or like the people who give lifts to others to enable them to get to the doctor or to the church or, or wherever they need to go. The thing about finding out what God is doing and then joining in is that it requires us to join in, to act and to do something. Sometimes we may not even realise what is going on, but when we start to do something, all of a sudden, because we have taken that step of faith, God blesses what we have done and it becomes really effective. I've seen that happen time and time again in people's lives and in the church. So in conclusion, to find out what God is doing and join in, all we need to do is be like Philip. We need to pray, that is, be open to God. We need to look and see what is going on in the life and hearts of individuals in the community. And we need to act in words and actions. And the strange thing is, as we do this, our faith blossoms through this process. There are so many good things that happen when we join in with God's mission through acting for God. We get built up and blessed. We make a positive difference to the world. And most importantly, God's kingdom grows. So let's finish by taking 30 seconds to pause and think how we are going to respond to that this coming week. How will we find out what God is doing and join in? Will we pray, look and act? In response to all that we've heard and said and sung, let's say this declaration of faith together. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
That's all for this service. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you've joined us for the, the premiere of this on, on Sunday morning, then as usual, we'll be meeting over Zoom straight after the service. Go and grab a coffee and come and have a little catch up with a few of us. It's always lovely. And we'll be back here next week, same time, same place. And in the meantime, you can always contact us at the following uh, stmatthewswalsall.co.uk email addresses. Uh, I, I'm curate at stmatthewswalsall.co.uk, Jim is at rector, the office is at office, and our online pastoral team is online at stmatthewswalsall.co.uk. So we'll close our service with this prayer. Draw your church together, O oh God, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world, and together witnessing to his love on every continent and island. Amen. Amen.